Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of our guests uh, tuning in from all over the world with us today. My name is Maggie Miller and I am Senior Director of the Hilton Humanitarian Prize at the Conrad N. Hilton Foundation. And we at the Hilton Foundation are just so thrilled and excited to be partnering with Atlas Core on our first ever uh, virtual Leadership Institute, which we are offering to all of our prize laureates. Um, it's, it's really meant at the broadest level to help support um, the growth of the next generation of humanitarian leaders around the world. And I know today we have the much broader Atlas Core joining us as well. So welcome to all of you. Um, I'm just absolutely delighted and excited um, for the conversation that's about to take place um, between two slash three of our former Hilton Humanitarian Prize laureates. I'm going to introduce our moderator who will introduce our other two speakers. Welcome Zainab. Um, good to see you. Um, so Zainab Salbi um, has so much experience and so many accomplishments many too, too many to mention here this morning. But what I'll start with is that at the age of 23, Zainab founded Women for Women International, um, which is a grassroots humanitarian and development organization dedicated to serving women survivors of war. Um, this organization, of course, received the Hilton Humanitarian Prize in 2006. Um, Zainab is also the author of, of several books, um, and most recently, she's she's currently the co-founder of Daughters for Earth, which is a $100 million fund aimed to mobilize women uh, to actively engage in climate change solutions. Um, so I, I could go on for 20 more minutes, but I, I'll stop and hand it over to you, Zainab. Thank you so much for joining us for what I know is going to be a thought-provoking and inspiring conversation. Thank you, Maggie. I really appreciate this kind introduction. And I appreciate, honestly, not only you, but all the team at the Conrad Hilton uh, Foundation and the Conrad Hilton Award. Um, as a, as a, an, um, an awardee and a laureate, um, I had the privilege of uh, being part of the family. And it does feel like family, indeed. Uh, once you're in, it's sort of your embrace in all different ways. Um, and uh, so thank you uh, for, for providing that space and providing that support and providing that love for all of us. Um, as I prepare for today, I was thinking that perhaps um, there has never or it, is, it has been a long time since humanity has lived through such a pivotal moment in our lives, in our history. Uh, a moment that uh, created a shared experience for all on the one hand with COVID-19 and on the other hand, it, it's uh, uh, showed, it, it provided a limelight on the disparity uh, that exists in our humanity between those who have and those who don't have, between those who have food and those who are hungry, between those who are healthy and those who are unhealthy. And, um, and it makes our sector, the humanitarian sector, um, even much more important than ever been. You know, it puts the pressure on us uh, not only to raise awareness about that disparity uh, in between us in humanity, but also about what can be done in an active, productive, loving and kind way that we can all move forward from this turning point moment in our uh, common history as human, <laughs> as humans, um, together forward in a in a healthier, hopefully way. Um, I, you know, a lot of pe people say um, coming back to normal. I would say go forward to the new, uh, to the new for uh, normal. We are to shape the new normal, as a matter of fact. And so, with this, I want to do two things. One is I um, want us uh, to take a moment to actually all go to our heart because the essence of anybody who gets involved in the humanitarian se uh, sector, it's heart, you know? I mean, that's what, otherwise, 
you would not go. <laughs> None of us would do the job, you know, but it's back to our beautiful heart and big hearts uh, that allows us and gives us the energy and the inspiration to go and do the hard work. Um, and talking about her, and, and yet sometimes we ignore our hearts in the journey, you know, and we go and because as we see the, the darkness of humanity, as I call it in my humanitarian work, you see the worst act, act of humanity, but you also see the best act of humanity. You see all the tears, but you also see the laughters and you see all the challenges. And frankly, you see all the inspirations as well. And, and that's, I think, what keeps us all going. Um, and today's conversation is about how do we go back to not only how do we move forward and how do, and, but how also do we move forward based on the principles of our hearts, ourselves, our leaderships, our, our teams, our community and the world. So how do we bridge all of these conversations uh, together? Because we are indeed the leaders we all are waiting for. This is it, you know, like this is us. Um, so before I introduce our, uh, the honor uh, of uh, having our uh, speakers, um, I want to um, um, remind everyone with a, a Rumi poem uh, or a line from Rumi, which he says, Rumi is a 13th century Sufi poet. And he says, when someone asks you what to do, um, open your hands like this and say, and light a candle and say, like this, just light a candle and show what anybody can do to make a difference in this world. And I have the honor truly to um, be in conversation with uh, Elena Bonamati, um, CEO of Tostan International and Dr. Mohammed Musa, the executive director of BRAC International. Both are colleagues of my friends. I have to admit that I've never had the privilege to meeting them. Um, I know the founders of both organizations very well, Dr. Uh, Abed, Sir Abed, and, uh, and, and Molly Malchin. And so I had the privilege of working with the founders of the organization and call them dear friends. Um, and now I have uh, the extreme excitement uh, to know you and to be in conversation with you and to collaborate with you. And with this, I want to ask uh, each one of you to start with uh, a two minutes introduction of yourself and your work. And I'd like to, uh, to start with Elena, if that's okay. Over to you. Thank you, Zain. I've been so honored to be at this table, uh, Dr. Musa also to be with you in this conversation. Uh, so, to start with maybe Tostan, uh, uh, so Tostan is a West African organization, but also international organization. We made long time ago the choice to be close to the communities that we serve. Eh? And Tostan means breakthrough in Wolof, eh? and this is where our headquarter is and where I'm based uh, with a team of Tostan International. Um, I think Tostan is known, perhaps uh, by, best known for the impact that it has had for women and girls, and in particular in reference with the abandonment of harmful practices. But actually, when I joined Tostan four years ago, following, of course, big shoes <laughs> and stepping into you know, the role that was played by our inspirational founder, Molly Merchin, I really found an empowering education model that was really lifting up the whole community and actually community well-being, and this across a, a, you know, a range of sectors. So uh, education, health, the environment, uh, uh, economic empowerment and governance. And actually I found a model that was very cost-effective that put a focus on sustainability and really ownership by the communities that we serve. So uh, I might say that this resonates with me personally. So I've been had the privilege really to work, to live and work with my family on the amazing African continent for more than 20 years now. So actually it came so naturally to land at Tostan because what we do resonates so much with what I feel. And uh, to go back to Zaina, but to, with my heart, eh? and of course with the, with the brain as well as a leader of organization. So, um, yeah, so I'm excited to be at this table because the Hilton Prize, 10 years, so I joined in 2017, 10 years after we won the prize, by far the greatest recognition our organization has had. And I think I still felt when I joined four years ago, the power, the transformative power that that prize had had for Tostan. And so we are really grateful to be part of this conversation and I look forward to it. Thank you, over to you, Dr. Musa.
floor. Mm, I also welcome everybody. My name is Musa Muhammad. I am from Bangladesh um, and I, I'm working with the BRAC International as its executive director. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, I would like to take this opportunity to talk a little bit about BRAC. You know, as uh, Jainab mentioned that BRAC was founded by a great leader and his name is Sir Fazli Hassan Abed. And going back to the history, in 1972, when Bangladesh had its uh, uh, war of independence, that caused uh, more than 3 million people are kind of uh, killed. Many are displaced, refugees. And at the end of the war, people are coming back. And as they are coming back, it was a devastated country. People lost their homes, they were burnt or, or, or looted. And that was the time when the country needed to be rebuilt. Sir Fazli Hassan Abed was working in a multinational company in England in a very senior executive position. And he thought this is the time to go beyond his own individual interest to do something for the people for whom he thinks the life should be. And he looked at himself and saw what is available to him. And he had only one small apartment in UK. And he sold it out. He sold it out. And with that, he went back to Bangladesh to a remote rural areas where returnees, refugee returnees are coming back. And as they were coming back, they did not have any house. And he thought, he thought, with the money that I have, little money, by selling one of my apartment, I'll help them build their houses. So he organized all those villagers and said, I'll be helping with your, your materials, and you have to build your own house. And that's the beginning. 900 plus houses are built with the money that, uh, that he bought from his own one apartment. Those are little hearts, but gave the hope. And as the hope began to come back, then other organizations came to request him, can you build on that? And that was the journey with it began back began in 1972. Now, today, it is one of the largest organizations dealing humanitarian and, and development programming in the world. We are in 11 countries in Africa, Asia. I have had the opportunity to work in Africa for 10 years, Asia for another 15 years in different countries, altogether eight different countries where I lived and worked. That gave me personal learning opportunity but also by working with Sir Fazli Hassan Abid, gave me the opportunity to really be a person who can lead with heart, not just with brain. And I'm honored to be able to come here today. Thank you very much for having me. Janab Ji, you are mute. Oh, sorry. I love the mention of heart because I think in um, this time, the moving forward entails heart and mind. You know, uh, it's, we can't only do with mind anymore. Um, that's, I feel like we, our mind got us to this moment in time. And now we're moving forward after COVID. I feel we need to move with heart and mind. I have a question for both of you, um, which is around the principles of the Hilton Humanitarian Prize Laureate Virtual Leadership Institute, um, self-development, uh, or developing self, developing others, and leading movements. Um, developing self, developing others, and leading movements. How do you center these practices in your work, both internally and externally um, in your, I would say in yourself, frankly, because then that's from where I believe the organizational work comes. So how do you do it both for yourself as well as for your organization? Maybe, Elena, you want to start? Absolutely. Thank you for asking these questions, Aina. But I, you, I said in the very beginning that, you know, I found an empowering uh, education model in Tostan that uh, enhanced community well-being. And actually, well-being is the key word we have at Tostan. And I think it responds to the three questions. You know, we have engaged, uh, we, have, we have committed programmatically to scaling that well-being. Of course, in the countries where we operate, we have a, a strong footprint in West Africa, in uh, Senegal and uh, the neighboring countries, but also beyond that, uh, through the Tostan Training Center, uh, where we really share our methodology, again, to bring uh, community well-being uh, to so many other organizations that came and shared with us what we have learned in the past 30 years. So when we start from well-being, we can see that self-dimension, the dimension of others, and to me it's the other we work with, so it's as well the colleagues, as well the community that we partner. But when it comes to movement building, it's really that community well-being that is spread. And, you know, we have a specific strategy for that to become really like a social earthquake, eh, where 
positive social norms are really um, spread across the social networks. Eh? So let me go back to that. When uh, I joined, I felt, of course, we had the inspired on advancing this work on community well-being. But you know, the staff, uh, uh, the staff were really asking that question: What about the, our well-being? What about the staff well-being? And you know, when you when you uh, and that was a very relevant question, you know, as humanitarian organization, we focus on the mission. We are mission driven. Everyone, as you said, comes first and eh? the communities that we serve come first. What about ourselves? What about the staff? Are we investing enough in their well-being, in their professional development, in their um, in their uh, path, in their journey, uh, in the uh, journey with the heart again to go back to the image and with the brain. So we invested and we had the chance to really to participate uh, to our research program, which is about organizational well-being, so that we can really align the programmatic move towards their well-being as well as the internal agenda. And I think. If you want to leave the talk, if you want to walk the talk, you need to be an example. So as a leader, I need to do that. I need to take care of my well-being first so that I can model others to do the same. So it has been a tremendous opportunity, of course, to, uh, ex uh, to exercise this self-care during COVID, really. Uh, um, taking uh, taking really choices, making choices, informed choices with those lenses of the well-being when the pandemic hit. So I think uh, really practicing well-being, walking the talk, align programmatic well-being with, of course, the, the the conducive environment at the workplace that allow for the per for the person to really fulfill their full potential at the same time to find a conducive environment to, to practice self-care, as well as leading uh, by that. So modeling uh, that uh, has really resonated very much with us. And we have so honored that we have been having a lot of attention towards what we are doing in terms of well-being in internally. And so I, I would be very happy to share some articles that we publish around this work uh, in, the, in, the, in the past two years. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dr. Musa. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, and I would, I, you know, to jump in in here because I, you know, I would love for more specifics because I think as found as leaders uh, in the humanitarian sector, we um, we talk about it, but the truth is, and I'm talking on my personal example, it's much harder to implement well-being on myself, like really hard. You know, it's like yeah, yeah, we. It's easier to do it for the people we're serving. It's easier to do it for the staff even, but really. <laughs> for ourselves is much harder. So Dr. Musa, I would love to see to learn from you. Um, what are your tips on how do you um, do that? How, what's your perspective on well-being as it relates to you, your staff, and your community? Yeah, no, thank you very much. Um, I'll come back to, the, I'll come to that question of uh, self-well-being too. Eh? And thanks, Elena, for mentioning that perspective. Uh, I'll also present my uh, a few cents of contribution in this regard uh, uh, with, within the perspective of this leadership journey uh, around which we are really talking today. Uh, and uh, at the surface, if I link it up with the work that I do, my colleagues do, and everybody undertakes, uh, on the surface, you will see it's a program BRAC is undertaking in the sector of health, in the sector of education, in the sector of ultra poor graduation by which you are lifting people in extreme poverty out of poverty situation in the sector of agriculture livelihood that's what on the surface you'll feel like we're doing our humanitarian program but if you really look below that what is really Iraq has been doing is a kind of social transformation it's a transformation by which you bring sustainable change sustainable change in which people take control of their own lives they have the self-dignity they control their own lives, they control their own destiny. And what we all do is unleash the potential of doing that, using health program as a vehicle to do that, using education program as a tool to do that, using agriculture program as a methodology by which you work with farmers and their families and the communities to bring them together to do things differently. But it's them, they take the leadership role. In this process, one thing I learned that actually Brack has been teaching something that how do you transform? And it begins with the transform yourself first, then help transform others with whom you are working, be it your immediate colleagues to the communities you are working with. And then collectively, how do you create that social movement that make that transformation possible? 
So in that way, that framework that we are talking about from Hilton principles, uh, that uh, developing yourself, developing others, and creating leading movement can fit very well with what Brax is that really transform yourself. In this regard, I would like to mention one thing we learned in Brax is that leadership is not about holding a senior position. Leadership is about bringing change that is good in the whole society. It's about making that transformation possible. And to do that, you work on yourself first. That's one thing we learned. And you work on yourself, basically challenge yourself, your own mindset. It's not about technical part of it only. Of course, in the leadership, there are technical aspects. You learn managerial aspects of leading organizations. But a larger part of it, that how do you transform yourself to become a role model, as Elena was mentioning? Becoming somebody, somebody that others see, not hear from. And therefore, others begin to really follow that, follow that by their own willingness. And that's what the most challenging part of becoming a leader, where you demonstrate by your own action. In that way, your humility, humbleness to begin with, respecting others to really uh, make sure that you are tapping the knowledge of others, be it in the local communities, be it your, your, your counterparts, partners, be it your own stuff. And that's one big thing. And when you are basically listening to them, be a good listener. And not only listener, you learn. And the learning is a process by which basically you, one thing you need to do, that how do you really change your own behavior? And I would like to mention that here, I was fortunate that I was a teacher of, I was a student of my mother. And she literally taught me what kind of human being you want to be. She literally taught me that your life would be not complete unless you share it with others, unless you do things, unless you do things that bring changes in others. That really got further enhanced when I joined BRAC and in my previous organizations that got really strengthened. And that was a helpful thing. So I would say that that internal learning is good on well-being thing that you, how do you feel well-being? You are, you are really feeling well-being. It's, it's basically an inner satisfaction that eventually give you a higher level of well-being than the physical well-being you may take from resting or traveling. And that inner satisfaction often come by seeing a child who would otherwise remain hungry is having food. A, a, a mother who would otherwise be suffering and possibly will be suffering because of the, of the unwanted pregnancy is doing better because of your health. A girl who otherwise would be having early marriage is, is in the school now. You'll feel that satisfaction. That give you, gives you a higher level of well-being because it's really not turning your own soul. Let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I'm going to add my my two cents on that as a as a laureate, a former laureate as well. And uh, Elena, would love to also for you to join. You know, I learned beside uh, to add honestly to all the things that you both joined is that, you know, and it took me a long time that when I am healthy, I am a healthier leader. Uh, when I am uh, happy, I'm a, a better leader. And when I'm grumpy and tired, it's not good. <laughs> it's not good for the team. It's not good for the work. And so, you know, when I shifted my attitude about, you know, seeing my own health and well-being as really integral part to my leadership and to my team and to the work, it became not about selfish act. It became part of the work, you know, so the exercise, the eating healthy, the even smiling. I remember going to a community in Congo and I was just researching and I and then they were like, thank you very much. I was like, no, I haven't done anything yet. We're just, I'm just asking questions. And they're like, no, but your smile gives us hope. And that's when I realized, wow, even people feel these small things, uh, you know, feel your presence, whether you're coming from a healthy place in yourself or an exhausted, depleted place in yourself. Um, um, Elena, you want to share quick about that, how you do the self-care? And I have a few follow-up questions, uh, particularly on, on uh, leadership. Absolutely. I just want to build on what you said, Zana, but at the very beginning and just now. I was saying, you know, in the few minutes I talked that COVID in particular, the pandemic, provided us the opportunity really to think differently about this. So the theory, of course, when you you are a better leader, if you better yourself, but you know, you said it, 
it's so difficult to do it. You know, you can do it for others, you can do it for the community, but then the, the big piece is starting from yourself. But that is the most important one because then you can lead, you can, you can model. Eh? And so for me, I'm talking from my uh, particular experience with this pandemic and, you know, being a mother of two young children and doing long office hours, as all of us, of course, have done. Uh, the fact of being at home has really re reposition actually my role within my family and then with the organization eh? and that has created the opportunity really to to re to see how we could be more efficient actually in what we do and and actually that happened at Tostan you know we are in a context where for example sometimes meetings we run late uh, we like to talk a lot we like to share and so we are always late that the following meeting is even later and etc so zoom for example for example provides us the opportunity to be so efficient to be to the point to speak less to be on time i was amazed by the power of reinventing ourselves in a, an environment we, that we have never thought it could work so well for us so remoteness has has worked actually very well has influenced well-being on so many of us but i must say in particular women working at Tostan because they had the opportunity really to better uh, juggle between all the different um, uh, you know, um, roles that we care in the in the household, and so that that I don't think we will never go back to that. I think we have seen the benefit as for the organization of of being better ourselves, and that that is really it's a game changer. It's been a game changer for me personally, and of course for for the organization. I also wanted to add something else, which is I think the intentionality. Um, you know, you want to, of course, naturally, as you said, Dr. Musa, you come to this because, and you want to be fully yourself because, you know, as being fully yourself, you can give to others. Eh? Uh, and some of us do this natural. It's fantastic. We had wonderful mothers and wonderful leaders that have inspired us to do so. But to me, what is being a game changer is the intentionality as manager of the organization to use the lenses of well-being in making choices for your staff, for the organization. That I, I now, uh, I ask, what, 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 why did you take that decision? Did you have that lenses of well-being when you took that decision? To me, that was a game changer, the intentionality. And that's why I was really keen in, in saying that. Beautiful. I want to talk about succession because you both followed the footstep of giant leaders um and and particularly founders of organizations which uh, you know it has a very particular stories around founders and you both have succeeded in that transition um i would you know i would love to hear from you um like at uh, some points of where are the major points that one needs to um be aware of as you address the transition in terms of you know potential challenges and where are the key reasons for success um, that made the path of transition um, better and easier for all um, can you talk about that I'll, probably I will start with Dr. Musa because you're sort of the the fresher one uh, having made the transition more recently um, from the late um, Sir Fazal Hazan Abed um, and the beloved. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about that, uh, Dr. Musa? No, thank you very much. Uh, you know, in succession, one of the important thing is the people, people with whom we work. You know, organizations are not buildings. Organizations are not rules and regulations. At the end, of course, they are there. But it's the people with whom we work. And one of the key point is that your people with whom you're working, you are part of a community we are we are working how do you really make sure that the, they remain focused on the purpose for which the organization exists so one of the key thing in the succession is to make sure that when this kind of transition takes place of course there will be a kind of chance of getting a little bit shock in the mind of the people who worked with your previous leader who was kind of the founder and you kind of see that but how do you bring those people together back again how do you really bring together and make sure that they understand that the leader who we are succeeding now together mm -hmm. is kind of left behind a purpose left for which we exist? And how do we collectively regroup again to really pursue that together? And that is one of the key things in succession 
is a requirement. You bring the team cohesion together, you bring that enthusiasm together, you see that purpose, and you really clarify that the best way you can really deliver to the, our respect to our previous leader or the founder is by delivering to that purpose. And that's one of the key things that leaders, uh, next level of leaders need to do. In this regard, I found that an important thing is like we did a series of kind of, uh, first we began with a retreat, bring people together. But then soon we were unfortunate that COVID-19 also came in, in our case, as the kind of, we were kind of separating us out. And some of the practical tools that we used, for example, having periodic town halls, where you bring all the stuff, sometimes bring a segment of the stuff, sub-segment of the stuff. So you bring them together, keep the enthusiasm up when they're all separated. And I found that tool, as Elena mentioned, through even online mechanism like this Zoom or, or even other tools that are there, Microsoft tools, all this, were extremely useful that you could connect quickly and really make sure that everybody feels they're connected and not disconnected. And they're connected not with each other, but with the purpose that is in mind. So I would add that be, be clear about this purpose, clarify that vision and mission for which you exist, and make sure that your team is kind of driven by that. And that's a very powerful thing. And at the same time, you also convey the message that we do care for each other as we care for others. And so uh, let me stop here. I think that's one of the key things is quite critical. That's beautiful, beautiful. It's like, so go out of your way to connect and, and uh, with people. I mean, in your case, Dr. Moussa, also it's a different case than what uh, Elena's uh, situation, because, you know, uh, Dr. Abid unfortunately uh, left us uh, here and it was a, a, a different kind of transition. In your case, Elena, it's, uh, you know, Mali is still uh, alive and well and... Uh, I'm curious, I'm, really engaging with us. <laughs> I'm curious how did that happen when the, when the founder is still in a in a prime time of her age even i would say you know um and yet still made the transition i obviously have gone through that myself with women Women international but i'm very curious to learn about uh, your experience elena uh, in that transition Thank you, Zaina. This is a very important question for me, of course, as an incoming leader after, you know, a CEO who's, who was there, not, not only an inspirational founder, but a CEO for 27 years. Eh? So definitely the transition has been a pivotal moment in the history of Tostan. And so, you know, I think we need to recognize this is not an easy process. Eh? And so I think it was very clear for me and for Molly, this needed to work for me as a new uh, CEO for the organization and of course for her as the founder as well. Eh? So there were these three pieces which were very you know, critical and important. And we decided to go uh, with a leadership style, with a transition mode that uh, isn't conventional. Eh? Uh, so we decided to adopt a, a um, um, a model that is called a table for two. So Molly is today a full-time employee of Tostan, uh, more energetic than ever because she has, uh, you know, took management, uh, you know, she put the management aside. So she has a revamped energy. So she's really our creative director. And we worked very closely together. Actually, she has chosen to report to me. Eh? So I think the key success factor of that transition, of that successful transition, but it's still ongoing. Eh? It's a process. It's not something that happens. Okay, here you go. Here's a new CEO. It doesn't happen like that because it's about people, as Dr. Musa said. Uh, first of all, it was really mutual respect, the respect of what we bring to the table. And, you know, uh, the confidence that needs to be uh, that needs to be built uh, across time again, and and so you know there are days who it wasn't easy. There were days who have been more easy, but I think what kept us together and really focus on what we needed to achieve is really putting the organization first. This was not about my agenda. This was not about Molly's agenda. This was about Tostan, the Tostan future. So how we, can we bring those three pieces together that it works? Again, made, uh, based on mutual respect, based on love, because you know this is about uh, bringing your heart to this conversation and acknowledging that it's not easy, that there is no right answer. There is not the only way to do this. You need to build this together. It's a process. It's a, it's a process that comes together. And I think both of us are very happy today because we are an asset, an incredible asset to the organization today. But I think Molly was very brave and recognized that it was time for her to step back. And, to, and she, was the, she was the one actually to empower me 
to go forward, you know? We discuss a lot, almost on a daily basis. We almost all, always disagree, but then we find a consensus, you know? We bring our own perspective, again, for the benefit and for the future of this organization. So again, it's, it has been an amazing journey for ourselves as a person, as individual, um, and for the organization. And, uh, and I think we are proud of that, and again, uh, I'm sure we would have done it differently. Uh, you know, every day has been, a, of course, a new thing, a new discovery. But we are happily uh, steering this organization together today. And of course, we are very proud of that. I mean, I don't think there's any easy way to do it, to be honest. I know Dr. Musa has some um, uh, another comment to talk about that. In my case, uh, just as a founder, what I, you know, decided it was a mental decision. It was a mental and emotional decision that I you know, um, sort of decided that I will give the baton to pass on the baton to the new leader and that I shall respect the new leader's decision, uh, whatever it is, I will express my opinion, but then I really have to step out of the decision making because I needed to, for me, the principle was to pave the path for success for her and to pave the path to success for success as a founder was actually stepping away from interfering in the decisions because as a founder, you have a more of an influential voice. And so really my attitude is was to support the leader, whoever she is, um, to succeed so she may succeed as in her own merit. And if it doesn't work, it's also not because someone interfered in her decisions in her success. Dr. Musa, you want to add to this discussion? No, very quickly, I want to say that uh, one other thing we learned about this succession that how our founder, in case of Breck, prepared himself and ourselves for the succession. His contribution itself was enormous. He, like he brought me on board four years before he handed over everything and said, I'm done. <clears throat> so we had opportunity to work together. As, as uh, Elena mentioned, every evening we're sitting together, three, four days a week, talking about history, the reason why we exist and what we are future goal. And those are the kind of things he was preparing us. And when he was, Handing over, he prepared a, a, a whole board to take over from that, that level and take the journey further forward. So role of the founder or the, or the leader who is handing over is equally important, if not more, in making a successful, successful transition and successful succession as much as the, the who is newcomer and taking over the button. It's very true. It's very true. We have now arrived to the Q&A part of our uh, our discussion. So I'm going to um, read uh, um, some of the Q questions. And I have one from Amelia who says, who are your mentors or role models? And how have they, uh, your mentors meaning, helped, uh, what have they done to stay true to their North Star, uh, true purpose? Who wants to take that? I can begin if... All right, uh, yeah. sure. Okay, no, thank you. I think I almost began answering that uh, question in my last uh, contribution. Uh, my primary mentor was my founder himself, you know, uh, because that, it was great to, as I said, it was great to be able to sit down with my leader before uh, and then really sit with him and learn about the vision. But more importantly, one of the things he was encouraging, learn from others too. Have your colleagues, your peer groups as your mentor. Have the colleagues who report to you as your mentor. Have the community people to be your mentor. And it's amazing that that push from him allowed us to learn from others. Learning is more important. So having learning orientation is more important. So don't get fixed to that one mentor model. M make sure that people with whom you are working, who report to you, they can be your best mentor because they see you through their lens. And if you are genuine about it, if you really open up with them and they are feeling fearless, they would give you the best possible mentoring support who, who actually report to you. And that's one of the best things I learned. That's beautiful. That's really beautiful. Elena? Yes, I would like to add that what you said, Dr. Musa, resonates very much to me, really listening and observing, really never make any assumption you know better than other. And that, that is really source of mentoring. But I think I see mentoring as a source of inspiration where, you know, when I feel a low in energy and I need that piece of advice, I 
normally regroup myself and go back to the field and really meet, as you said, the communities that we serve. They are the best mentors. They are the ones who keeps you really inspired. And I remember, you know, uh, some of you know key moments uh, um, of in my life experience, in my professional experience, of those moments where I felt, okay, I need, I, I will be part of this to be changed. Huh? And that, that are the inspirational moments that are my mentors. And I remember in particular when I was in Burkina Faso and I was quite young in my career, really. Uh, having seen, uh, you know, babies, uh, 13 years old, okay, younger women, but to me, babies, caring their babies. And this is one of the images that really uh, brings me a lot of inspiration so that those girls, as you mentioned in the introduction to Musa, who are maybe early married, but today could be in school if, uh, you know, the situation uh, um, can be reversed. So I think those are the, the best moment of inspiration and mentoring for me really beautiful and I really connect and associate with all of it. I have to add that I over time learned to seek mentors in other sectors, not only our sector, the humanitarian sector, because I learned that when you expose yourself to other sectors, whether it's artists and literature uh, from the literature or they are or CEOs of companies or whatever, you actually learn a lot from how different minds in different sectors worked and uh, work, you know, and it was from the CEO of Chanel, I learned that it's important to introduce art in my life as a way to inspire me. It is from the women, definitely I served, you know, to introduce, you know, to challenge my thinking and of course the staff, but also from, you know, authors and all of that, like always surround yourself with different different people, you know, to who would inspire you and bring you different limelights into your life and into why we are doing and how do we do it in a healthy way. We have another question. Um, it says, that, as a leader, how do you balance delivering programs, completing objectives and reporting to your donors with the need of looking after yourself and your team? What would be your indications of achieving that balance? And without knowing who the question came from, because it's a hard balance. It's really a hard balance. I mean, the work can take over you so easily. Um, it's a, things that we all face. How do you deal with it? Give Like if you can give a quick tip uh, for that each. Um, I don't know who wants to go first. Maybe let me start. I've already, you know, uh, said my tip, which is the intentionality of taking those decisions that are, you know, balancing um, the need for delivery, but also the need to take care and to invest in the organization, I would say, because when you talk about reporting, taking care, looking at, after yourself, the team, it means providing them opportunities to grow within the organization. No one has never money enough for investing in training. Uh, you know, take some time off to uh, pursue that particular experience or take some time to do a specific research. There's never time for that. Though these are really things that really fuel also uh, the performance, the inspiration, and uh, the capacity for the staff to better do their work. Eh? And I would also say, um, in particular, because this person mentioned reporting to donors, I think bring the supporters of the organization into what it means to really work for an organization. It cannot be only about programs, you know? Some of them are asking you, how much do you invest in this? I don't think it's a question of the ratio in terms of the financial ratio. It's, it's, a, it's a matter of allowing people to do their job, to deliver quality, also because they feel uh, what, what it brings them to bring quality. And so I think bring the supporters into that journey, it's very important and speak the truth. You know, you can't just say, uh, you know, say something because people are expecting you to say that thing. I don't think that gives us service in this sector. I think we should say that it is normal to invest 20% of our annual budget into training to invest in our organization because 80% to the programmatic work is a lot, but in order to be able to deliver quality, we need to that 20% really in investing in ourselves. Over to you, Dr. Yeah, no, thank you, Elena. Uh, excellent. I'll just build on what you said. Uh, anyway, at the end, uh, the, uh, the job we do, it's not about you do the job yourself. It's about get the job done by the team. And therefore, forming team is extremely important. And form a team, one of the job that we as leaders or you can say manager, we do, we do two roles. Leadership and management are not the same thing exactly. There's some overlap, but we work, work both as leader and manager. And one of the things you need to do is to really look into your own strength. 
and also be very aware about your own weaknesses or gaps. You make sure that you form a team that that fills out the gaps that you have on in yourself, that uh, that you have the deficiency in, in, in you, and make sure that those strengths are in your team. But also some of the things you may be strong, you want to uh, really delegate, also bring those in your team. So having the right team is extremely important first. Second, you delegate, but delegate with support. Delegate not, not totally, delegate and remain engaged in supporting and encouraging and you stay behind it. Mm -hmm. Let that team members make mistakes. Mm -hmm. It's like a soccer game. In the soccer game, you'll find a captain in the field, but there are other 10 team members. And captain alone does not play. Captain finds out who is has what strength and what the ball should be given to for what kind of thing. So figuring that out and making sure that you are getting the all of the job pieces done by your team. And therefore, you make your time so that you can also relax, take care of yourself while the game is ongoing. Mm -hmm. and, but make sure that they also feel that you have not delegated and removed yourself. You mm -hmm. delegate and staying engaged, but engaged not to interfere with their job, not to micromanage, but to make sure that they feel they are being supported as needed. And that's the way to go. No, I really love that. And what I'm hearing also through the lines is sort of allow for vulnerabilities, mistakes. You know, we sort of don't allow ourselves to make mistakes and there's zero tell. But, you know, when you look at the corporate sector, they allow for mistakes, you know, and we are dealing with hard circumstances. So it's sort of rather than being ashamed of our mistakes, it's sort of, you know, what I'm hearing from you is allowing it, talking about it, being showing vulnerability in the fact that this can happen to all of us as individuals or as collective organizations. And I would use it as an engagement even with, with the donors, because whenever I went to a donor, I said, I made this mistake or I failed in this project. The response actually was more positive than negative uh, because it was transparent from me and not hiding or shying away from it. Um, I have a question from uh, Nati and Noor, who says, how do you unite a team around a shared vision? And how do you handle disagreements on organizational goals? If I may jump in. Please, I see you. I see you ready. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry. I forgot to unmute uh, mute myself, but let me go ahead. Uh, actually, uh, to begin with, creating shared vision itself is an exercise by which you create enthusiasm of everybody. And shared vision has to be genuinely shared. That means you collectively create that vision for which you want to go. And there are various tools in the leadership and management literatures, and many of them we apply, by which you come together with your back, uh, analytic background and analytic data, sit together and create the vision, which is exciting vision which must excite you, which, which must really give you energy, which must drive you forward, and not just you. The team feels that this is the one, yes, we want to do. And creating that requires a facilitation methodology. And as a leader, one of the things, therefore, one of the tools you often use is facilitate. Facilitate rather than tell. So being the team, facilitate a process where you co-create that vision. And once you co-create that vision, all of the disagreements and other things will be coming to the debate. And making helping team navigate through the debates and discussion to reach to an agreement that this is something exciting we want to go to will automatically bring that commitment and that's one of the things i have applied and seen that it works thank you elena yeah you know disagreement is so healthy as i said you know brings to the debate brings to the discussion because things need to be discussed you know we have different interpretation of what we want to achieve and how we want to achieve but i think what and there should be discussion about this. And of course, that brings to the consensus that then is carried forward. What I think is not debatable in a sense of not cannot be compromised is the shared values that bring us to the work. And I've seen this, you know, something is saying that you agree with those values, something is practice those values. And I've seen in different organizations then, you know, at the end, there is always someone, of course, that maybe speak those values but doesn't doesn't talk those sorry talk those values but doesn't walk those values and those person automatically or naturally don't belong anymore and they leave or that you know they they become so i think that is a, a generative process in an organization that is natural that is normal we need to accept that there is disagreement and some disagreements come back to the consensus as dr musa said some others 
uh, will dissipate by themselves because maybe those don't belong anymore. So I think this is good. The new talent comes in, uh, you know, uh, others move on. And this is this is about the institution. I think this is what. So if you create that process for this shared vision to became to regenerate, to become stronger, and you have processes that really fuel that, I think that makes the organization very strong and really aligned in, in, in the mission. That's beautiful. What I'm hearing from you, Elena, is sort of you're using challenges uh, as opportunities. So even if challenges arise among the team, you know, it's also kind of always be fair. Which is always true and it's beautiful. And, uh, and, and allowing and not seeing disagreement as a point of contention, but a point of healthy discussions and you know i mean in my times and i would you know distinguish to the team between what is discussions and what is decisions you know and at one point one has to close the discussions and say okay we are do moving this forward you know um but what i love the most is that the values of individual team members are most important more than skill sets more than anything is you either have the values or you don't and and that would constitute a great team member i have a question from ankita who asked, how do you keep yourself motivated? Because sometimes things don't work as we plan. We struggle with challenges. How do you keep yourself uplifted? So if I may jump on it, if I may. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just, uh, but uh, the reason I wanted to jump that I have a last comment on the earlier discussion. That, you know, this uh, you can create a team where there is a belief that our strength is to be able to embrace differences, embrace diversity embrace the different in opinions and views and that allows you to if you can embrace right then you can create higher value than if you just go in one direction and when you, your team is kind of a believer of that then you'll say the debate portion goes down there will be debate but eventually that notion that we can create higher value for the organization by embracing the differences and debates that is really that helps coming back to ankita's question you know one of the thing i would say important thing is to not to get demotivated by an incidence or event or or something happened today you keep your focus on the purpose for which you exist the the reason why we are in this game the difference that we wanted to make that's far bigger than maybe something didn't go very well today uh, one of my friend who plays uh, in a cricket tournament said one match in a tournament does not really frustrate me. Even two does not. Even three does not. I remain focused that at the end of my career, am I making the difference that I wanted to make in the lives or in the end, the feeling of the people that they felt good about living in this world? And if that is your purpose clear, you don't worry about a one loss in one disappointment today. You keep your focus to that longer term purpose. Beautiful. Really beautiful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Elena. Sorry, Elena, I took over from you. <laughs> no, 100%, Dr. Musa, the clarity of the purpose is the guiding light. It's that candle that Zena showed us at the very beginning. So 100%, the clarity of that purpose. Wonderful, wonderful. And and the allowing, because nothing about life, I mean, Rumi, to, to go back to Rumi as we uh, get to the end of our conversation, there is a poem, and I'm paraphrasing here, it says, if the hand is always spread open, then, or if it's always a fist, then there is no development, that our growth as individuals, and I would see, I would, from learning today from you, as organizations have... Um, a breath of its own, a consciousness of its own, as our growth as individuals and as collective comes because sometimes we are open and they were closed. Sometimes we are successful and sometimes we're not. Sometimes we're happy. And, so. and it's in that movement that we grow and we learn. Uh, and that is life. That is life. So how do we allow for that circle of life to live through us, as Dr. Musa said, and not be disenchanted when they're, they're hard moments and, and, and look at the big picture. And the big picture for me is, um, you know, the moments between ourselves and our hearts in, in an end of a night, you know, uh, or in our uh, last breath is, uh, did I do 
uh, all what I could in, in this life uh, or did I withhold? And that's for me is the testament actually. It's not even the accomplishment. It's did I try um, to give my best to this to this world or not? And I, I know I'm speaking with lighthearted and light, like-minded community uh, who understand that. And with that, I want to end with asking the very last question, uh, which is what is the best piece of advice, of career advice, that you have ever had? Maybe Elena? Yeah, let me start. Uh, um, indeed, by far the best one. Take a deep breath and stop. Just step back. So when I, um, I, I was in Kenya, actually, I was about to uh, move to Senegal personally. Um, I didn't have a, a job lined up. I was following my husband with my kids. You know, I was in the middle of my career. I, you know, I just did an MBA, I was working, you know, ah, you name it, eh? uh, personal and professional, just a whirlwind. And so I consulted with a couple of people, in particular women, and I said, no, how can I stop in the middle of my career? What's my step? So everyone, the, the one I trusted, told me, just take a step back, Elena. Just take one time for yourself. Just focus on your strength. Just try to see what, what is the best step for you. What makes sense for you now in your life? And, you know, I took a step back for a year. It was the best year, the, the best move I could do. And then the Tosan opportunity came. And I think I was ready to step into that role, which was a big move for me. But I was ready because I had stepped back. I, I had that clarity of the purpose. I had that intentionality. I had those, that strength in my values, in what I wanted to achieve in my life. And th this is why I'm here today talking to you at the Sea of Tostan, because I did take the courage to step back and, and really to look at my life and, and really t take a stock and, and move forward afterwards. So that was my best advice. Brilliant, brilliant. Dr. Musa. That's, that's excellent, Elena. I'll just um, take the other dimension, which is a little bit tactical thing that you can also do if I have one advice, and that is more build your learning agility. You know, if there's one competency you want to build, build the learning agility. And it's not easy because learning, as, learning agility is often inversely proportional to defending your own decision. When you do something and, and then you see that that's being challenged, don't defend. See what is the learning within that and learn. And learn, learning means you really shift your own belief system, mindset from point A to point B. Learning means things that you have never done, you're facing for the first time. You quickly learn how to do it and you have the courage to really take it over. And therefore, if you can build your learning agility, then you'll be facing the world, which is unknown, and will be able to navigate through it. And that is one thing I will definitely say that in addition to what Elena said, build that competency and it could be built. It's not something people born with, but can be acquired and you can do it. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. You know, I will contribute my uh, 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 advice, which is the cause that we're working on does not require us to self-sacrifice ourselves, that it is okay, that is actually our self-care is part of the cause and we are an extension of it. Um, and speaking about that, I want to thank all of you, both of you, particularly Dr. Elena Bonametti and Dr. Musa for filling my heart with love and joy. And may we dance and dance in our work until the very end, the very end, um, and do it with determination and joy and vision as you so clearly show it. Uh, so thank you so much for all your sharing, authentic, vulnerable, beautiful sharing. I really appreciate it. I also really appreciate um, special thanks to the Conrad Hilton Foundation for their support of our conversation and the Atlas Corps as an implementing partner. Uh, and I invite you all uh, to learn more about the Conrad Hilton Prize by visiting uh, hiltonfoundation.org. You can also learn about the Hilton Humanitarian Prize Laureate Virtual Leadership Institutes by visiting hilton.atlascorps.org. 
And with that, I want to uh, pass it on to the one and only uh, Maggie Miller, the most wonderful leader I know and a source of my personal inspiration. Over to you, Maggie. Thank you so much. You're on mute, Maggie. Sorry. Oh, I'm, I'm, am I back? Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Zainab and Elena and, and Dr. Musa. Uh, truly, 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 it's so... It's so interesting. I feel every time at such a loss of words after listening to um, our prize laureates because your work is just so phenomenal. I But I think I was trying to think about how to reflect on this conversation. And I think for all of the scholars tuning in today, it's important to remember that Zainab and Dr. Musa and Elena all started from somewhere just like every single person joining um, this session today is starting from somewhere. And I know in this type of work and seeing such powerful leaders like this, it can be intimidating. Um, so uh, I just want to thank the three of you for, for opening the doors of your hearts and minds to, to let us in on, on how you approach your work. For me, I heard about heart and humility and well-being and succession planning, um, connection to one another, connection to purpose. Um, and I heard loud and clear the power of mentors. Um, I was blown away by Dr. Musa's comment that the people who report to you can be your best mentors because that's what I live by, um, but I've never heard it articulated. And our community members can be our mentors. Um, so I think, you know, the knowledge around this virtual table today is immense, um, and we're extraordinarily grateful for it. If you want more <laughs> where this came from, read the books written by the leaders around this table, um, and their partners, because there's more knowledge there. Um, I will end by saying, uh, that Zainab, your smile gives us hope, um, as you, as you shared earlier, your smile still gives us hope today. And I think that the scholars joining us uh, give everyone who appeared on the screen hope. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Uh, it truly was an honor. And uh, I think that's a wrap. <laughs>